The emperor drank nothing but Chambertin, and rarely pure. He did not like wine much, and was no judge of it. That reminds me that one day at the camp of Bologna, having invited several officers to his table, his majesty sent some of his wine to Marshal Agaro and asked him with a certain air of satisfaction how he found it. The marshal tasted it for a while, clacking his tongue against the roof of his mouth and ended by saying, There's some that's better. In that the most insinuating tone, the emperor, although he had expected a different reply, smiled like the rest of the guests at the marshal's frankness. Everybody must have heard that his majesty took the greatest precautions against being poisoned. That is a story to be put along with that of the ball and poniard proof cuirass. On the contrary, the emperor pushed his confidence much too far. His breakfast was brought every day into an antechamber open to all to whom he had accorded a private audience. And they were sometimes waiting there for hours together. His Majesty's breakfast also waited for a long time. The dishes were kept as warm as possible until he came out of his cabinet to sit down at table. Their Majesty's dinner was carried from the kitchen to the upper apartments in covered baskets, but it would not have been difficult to slip poison into them. Nevertheless, no attempt of this kind ever occurred to the minds of the servants whose devotion and fidelity to the emperor, even that of the lowest of them, surpassed all I could say about it. The habit of eating precipitately often occasioned the emperor violent pains in the stomach, which nearly always ended in vomiting. One day, one of the valets on duty came in a great hurry to notify me that the emperor was urgently calling for me, that his dinner had disagreed with him, and he was suffering very much. I ran to his majesty's chamber and found him stretched at full length on the carpet. It was his habit when he felt indisposed. The empress Josephine was sitting beside him with his head upon her lap. He whined and stormed by turns, for the empress supported this sort of pain worse than the thousand more serious accidents incident to camp life. And the hero of Arcola, whose life had been risked in a hundred battles and elsewhere than in combats, without his courage being taken unaware, showed himself more than effeminate for a trifling hurt. A oh, boo-boo. Her Majesty the Empress was consoling and encouraging as best as she could. Courageous herself when suffering from a headache so violent as to amount to real illness. She would willingly, had that been possible, have assumed her husband's malady, the sight of which perhaps made her suffer more than he did. Constant, she said as soon as I entered. Come quickly, the Emperor needs you. Make him some tea and do not leave him until he's better. His Majesty had hardly taken three cups when his pain diminished. He still kept his head on the knees of the Empress, who caressed his forehead with her white plump hand and also rubbed his chest. Do you feel better? Will you lie down a little? I will stay by your bed with Constant. Was not this tenderness very touching, especially in so lofty a rank? The nature of my duties often gave me opportunities of enjoying this picture of a happy family life. While I am on the subject of the emperor's maladies, I will say a few words of his most serious one, if we accept that which caused his death at the siege of Toulon in 1793, when the emperor was still only a colonel of artillery. A gunner was killed at his place. Colonel Bonaparte seized the rammer and fired several discharges himself. The unfortunate artilleryman had, or rather had had, an itch of the most malignant description, and the emperor was infected by it. It was years before he could be cured, and the doctors thought that this badly treated malady was the cause of the extreme meagerness and the bilious hue which he long retained. At the Tuileries, he used sulfur baths and for some time wore a blister. Until then, he had always refused, saying that he had no time to nurse himself. Monsieur Corvissar had strongly insisted on a coterie, but the emperor, who was bent on preserving the shape of his arm intact, declined this remedy. 
It was at the same siege that he had been promoted from the rank of chief of battalion to that of colonel at the close of a brilliant affair against the English, in which he had received a bayonet thrust in his right thigh, the scar of which he often showed me. The wound he received in the foot at the Battle of Ratisbon left no trace, and yet when the emperor got it, the whole army was alarmed. We were about 1,200 feet from Ratisbon when the emperor, seeing the Austrians flying in all directions, thought the affair was ended. His canteen breakfast had been made ready in the place the emperor had designated. He was walking towards the spot when, turning to Marshal Berthier, he exclaimed, I am wounded. The blow had been so forcible that the emperor had fallen into a sitting posture. He had, in fact, just received a ball in the heel. The caliber of this ball showed that it had been fired by a Tyrolese rifleman, whose weapon usually carries as far as we were from the city. It may readily be believed that such an event soon spread trouble and alarm throughout the staff. An aide de camp came to look for me, and when I arrived, I found Mr. Yvonne engaged in cutting off his majesty's boot and i assisted in dressing the wound although the pain was still very keen the emperor would not even wait to have his boot put on again but to give the enemy his change and reassure the army he mounted a horse and set off at a gallop with all his staff and went through all the lines on that day as one may imagine nobody breakfasted and everybody went to ratisbon for dinner his Majesty had an invincible repugnance for all medicaments, and when he took any, which very seldom happened, it was the broth of chicken or chicory and sauce of tartar. Mr. Carvisser had advised him to reject any drink which had an acrid and disagreeable taste. I think it was through fear that someone might try to poison him. No matter at what hour the emperor might have gone to bed, I entered his chamber between 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning. I have said already that his first questions invariably related to the time and the weather. Sometimes he complained to me of looking badly. When that was true, I agreed to it. As I said, no when I did not think so. In this case, you'd pull my ears, call me laughingly, a great stupid. Asked for a mirror and often owned that he had wanted to deceive me and that he was very well. He took his newspapers, asked for the names of those who were in the waiting room, said whom he would see, and chatted with one or another. When Monsieur Corvassar came, he answered without waiting for an order. The emperor liked to tease him by talking about medicine, saying that it was only a conjectural art, that doctors were charlatans, and giving proofs of this, especially from his own experience. The doctor never gave in when he believed himself in the right. During these conversations, the emperor was shaving himself, for I had at last succeeded in inducing him to take this matter solely into his own hands. He often forgot that he had shaved only one side. I apprised him of it. He would laugh and finish his work. Monsieur Ivan, ordinary surgeon, had, like Monsieur Corvassar, his full share of criticisms and hard sayings against his art. These discussions were most amusing. The emperor at such times was very gay and talkative. And I think that when he had no convenient example to cite in support of his arguments, he did not scruple to invent one, nor did these gentlemen believe themselves always on their parole. One day, his majesty, following his singular habit, took the notion to pull the ears of one of his physicians, Mr. L.A., I think. The physician drew back quickly, saying, Sire, you hurt me! Perhaps the remark was seasoned with a spice of ill humor, and perhaps also the doctor was right. However that might be, his ears were never in danger from that day. Sometimes before my duties began, his majesty would question me on what I had done the day before. I would ask if I, he would ask if I had died in the city, and with whom. If they had received me well, and what we had for dinner. Sometimes, too, he wanted to know what such or such a part of my clothes cost me. I would tell him, and that the emperor would exclaim at the price and say that when he was a sub-lieutenant, everything was a good deal cheaper. And that he had often dined at Rose's, a restaurant keeper of that day, and that he dined there very well for 40 sous. 
Several times he talked to me about my family, of my sister, who was a nun before the revolution and who had been forced to leave her convent. One day he asked me if she had a pension and how much it was. I told him and added that it was not sufficient for her needs and that I gave her a pension myself and to my mother also. His majesty told me to address myself to the Duc de Bassano Marais that he might make his report on the subject as he wished to benefit my family. I did not profit by his good in- the good intention of his majesty, for at that time I was so happy as to be able to aid my relatives. I did not think of the future, which seemed to me could change nothing in my lot, and I scrupled at putting my family, so to stay, say, at the expense of the state I own, that I have since been more than once disposed to repent of this excess of delicacy, the example of which I have seen few few persons, whether above or below my position, willing either to give or take. On rising, the emperor usually took a cup of tea or of orange water. He took a bath. It was immediately on leaving his bed, and while in it, he had his dispatches and journals read to him by his secretary, by Monsieur de Burienne until 1804, when he did not take a bath, he sat down by the fire for the same purpose, unless he read his papers himself, as he often did. He dictated to his secretary his responses and the observations suggested to him by what he saw in the journals. As fast as he read through them, he threw them on the floor in a disorderly heap. The secretary afterwards gathered them up, put them in order, and carried them into the private cabinet before making his toilet. His majesty put on in summer a pair of white piquet trousers and a white dressing gown of the same material in winter these were replaced by others of a soft woolen goods called mulleton on his head he wore a bandana handkerchief knotted over the forehead the two ends of which fell down to his neck behind the emperor himself put on this elegant coiffure in the evening when he left the bath another bandana was handed him because that he had on was always wet, and he was constantly turning in the water. The bath over the dispatches read, he began his toilet. I shaved him before I had taught him to shave himself. When the emperor first acquired this habit, he availed himself, like everybody else, of a mirror attached to the window. But he came so near it and besmeared himself so recklessly with soap that the glass, the window panes, the curtains, and his own dress were covered with it to remedy this inconvenience a council of attendants was summoned and it was resolved that Rustem should hold the mirror for his majesty when the emperor had shaved one side he turned to the night and made Rustem go from left to right or from right to left according to the side on which he had begun the toilet table was transferred in like manner his shaving over the emperor washed his face and hands and carefully attended to his nails afterwards i took off his flannel waistcoat and his shirt and rubbed the whole chest with an extremely soft silk brush i rubbed him afterwards with cologne water a great deal of which he consumed in this manner for he was brushed and arranged in this way every day it was in the orient that he had acquired this hygienic habit she found very good and which is in fact excellent all these preparatives being terminated i put a pair of light flannel or cashmere socks in his feet and over the white silk stockings he never wore any others drawers of very fine linen or twilled cotton and sometimes of white cashmere with soft riding boots and sometimes tights of the same stuff and color with little english boots which reached to the middle of his cap they were provided with small silver not more than six lines long all his boots were spurred in this way then i put on his flannel waistcoat and his shirt a very fine muslin cravat and above it a black silk stock finally a short vest of white pk and either a riding coat or that of a grenadier, but more frequently the former. His toilet finished his handkerchief his snuff box and a little shell box filled with licorice flavored with aniseed and cut very fine were handed to him. It is plain from all this that the emperor had himself dressed from head to foot. He never put a hand to anything, but let himself be treated like a child. And during this process, he occupied himself with his affairs. I forgot to say that for his teeth, he used a wooden toothpick and a brush dipped in an opiate. 
The Emperor was born, one might say, to be waited on by Violets de Chambre, while yet in general he had three, and he was served with as much luxury as would in the highest station. From that period he received all the attentions which I have just described, and which it was almost impossible for him to dispense with. And it could change nothing in this respect. It augmented the number of his attendants, decorated them with new titles, but he could not surround him with more attentions. He was very rarely submitted admitted to the grand etiquette of royalty never for example did the grand chamberlain put on his shirt for him once only at the repast which the city of paris offered him at the time of his coronation the grand marshal held the basin for him to wash his hands i shall describe his toilet on the coronation day and it will be seen that even then his majesty the emperor of the french required no other ceremonial than to which General Bonaparte and the First Consul of the Republic had been accustomed. The emperor had no fixed hour for retiring. Sometimes he went to bed at 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening, but more frequently, he sat up until 2 or 3 in the morning or 4. He was very quickly addressed. It was his habit on entering his chamber to throw each of his apparel in every direction. His coat on the floor, his grand cordon on the carpet, his watch flying on the bed, his hat to a distance in the chair, and thus with all his garments one after another. When he was in a good humor, he called me in a loud voice, this sort of cry, oh, 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 at other times when he was dissatisfied, it was monsieur, monsieur, monsieur Constant, at all seasons. It was necessary to warm his bed. He never dispensed with this except in the greatest heat. His habit of addressing himself in haste sometimes gave me nothing to do on coming in but to present him with his bandana. Afterwards, I laid in his night lamp, which was in silver gilt and shaded so as to give less light. When he did not go to sleep at once, he had one of his secretaries called or else the Empress Josephine to read to him. No one could perform this office better than Her Majesty the emperor preferred her to any other reader she read with that special charm which blended with all her actions by the emperor's orders we burned in his chamber in little silver gilt vessels alone either aloe wood or else sugar or vinegar it was necessary necessary <laughs> to have fire in all his apartments nearly all the year. He was habitually very sensitive to cold. When he was ready to sleep, I re-entered, took his light, and went up to my own room, which was directly above that of his majesty. Rustam and a valet de chambre on duty stepped, slept in the little salon adjoining the emperor's chamber. If he needed me in the night, a wardrobe boy who slept close by in the antechamber came to look for me. Day and night, water was kept hot for his bath. For often, at any hour of the day or night, he took a notion to have one. Monsieur Yvonne made his appearance every night and morning at the coucher and levee of his majesty. It is known that the emperor often had his secretaries and even his ministers summoned during the night. During his stay in Warsaw in 1806, Prince de Talleyrand once received a message after midnight. He came at once and talked for a long time with the emperor. The work was prolonged far into the night, and his majesty fatigued. At last fell into a profound sleep. The prince de Benevento, who feared that if he went out, he would awaken the emperor, and perhaps be called back to continue the conversation, looked around him and perceiving a convenient sofa, stretched himself upon it, and went to sleep. Mr. de Meneval, his majesty's secretary was unwilling to go to bed until after Mr. de Talleyrand should have withdrawn, as the emperor might need him after the minister's departure. Hence, he was very impatient at this long audience, nor was I in a better humor, for it was impossible for me to go to bed until I had taken away his majesty's light. Monsieur de Meneval came to me ten times to ask whether Prince de Talleyrand was gone. He's still there, said I. I am sure of it, and I hear nothing. At last, I begged him to stay in the room where I was, and on which the entrance door opened, while I would go and stand sentry in a private cabinet, into which the emperor's chamber had another exit. It was agreed that whichever of the two should see the prince go up, should notify the other. Two o'clock struck, then three, then four. No one appeared, not the slightest movement in the chamber of his majesty. Losing patience at last, I pushed the door ajar as softly as possible. 
But the emperor, who was always a light sleeper, awoke with a start and loudly demanded, Who is there? Who goes there? Who is it? I replied, thinking that the Prince de Benevento had gone out. I had come to take the light. Talleyrand! Talleyrand! His majesty exclaimed quickly, Where is he then? And seeing him wake up, Well, I believe he fell asleep. How? You rascal, you sleep in my house? Ah! Ah! I went away without taking the light. They began talking again, and Monsieur de Meneval and I waited <laughs> the end of the tete-a-tete until five o'clock in the morning. The emperor had been accustomed to take coffee with cream or else chocolate when working at night, but he had abandoned the habit, and under the empire, he no longer took anything, unless at times, but very rarely, either some punch almost as weak as lemonade or an infusion of orange flowers or tea. The emperor, who endowed the majority of his generals so magnificently, who was so liberal to his armies and to whom, on the other hand, France owes so many fine monuments, was not at all generous, but if I may say it, a little miserly in his household. Perhaps he somewhat resembled those rich, vain persons who economized very closely at home in order to shine more brilliantly abroad. He made very few not to say no presents to his attendants. Even New Year's Day passed without unloosening his purse strings. Well, Monsieur Constant, said he to me, pitching my ear, what are you going to give me for New Year's? The first time he asked this question, I replied that I would give him whatever he liked. But I confess that I greatly hoped that on the next day it would not be I who would give presents. It seems that the idea never occurred to him, for no one was called on to thank him for his gifts. And never afterwards did he depart from this rule of domestic economy. A propos of this ear pinching to which I returned so many times, because his majesty himself returned to it so often, I must say while well, I think of it, and to be done with it, that it would be a great mistake to suppose that he contented himself with lightly touching the part exposed to his marks of favor. He squeezed very roughly to the contrary. And I have remarked that he pinched hardest when he was in the best humor. Sometimes as I was entering his room to dress him, he would rush at me like a madman. And while saluting me with his favorite greeting, et bien, Monsieur de la Troll, would pinch both my ears at once in a way to make me cry out. It was not even rare for him to add to these soft caresses one or two slaps very well laid on. I was sure then of finding him in a charming humor all the rest of the day and full of benevolence. As I have so often seen him, Rustem and Ivan Marshal, Bertie A, Prince de Neuchâtel, received their own good share of these imperial marks of affection. I have frequently seen them with their cheeks all red and their eyes almost weeping. <laughs> Next chapter. The sum fixed on for the toilet of his majesty was 20,000 francs. He was very angry. Between, because this sum was greatly exceeded the year of the coronation, it was with great trembling that the different budgets for the household expenses were submitted to him. He was constantly retrenching and curtailing and recommending all sorts of reforms. I recollect that on asking a place worth 3,000 francs for some, which he granted me, he exclaimed, 3,000 francs? But you are well aware that that is the revenue of one of my communes. When I am sub-lieutenant, when I was sub-lieutenant, I did not spend that. This expression was constantly cropping up in the warnings given by the emperor to persons with whom he was familiar. And when I had the, when I had the honor to be a sub-lieutenant, was often on his lips and always for the purpose of making exhortations of economical comparisons. A propos of these presentations of budgets, I recall one circumstance which ought to find a place in my memoirs, because it is wholly personal to me, and because, moreover, it may give an idea of the manner in which the emperor understood economy. It started from the notion, often very correct, in my opinion, that in his public expenses, even granting the property of the people, I admit it was a supposition the emperor was little inclined to make. The same things might be done for much less money. Hence, when he required diminutions, he did not wish to apply them to the number of objects of expenses, but to the prices set upon these objects by the purveyors. I shall have occasion to cite elsewhere several examples of the influence exerted by 
this idea and the conduct of his majesty with regard to the responsible agents in his government for the present i will set down here what relates to me one day when the different private budgets were being settled the emperor scolded a good deal over the cost of the stables and struck off a considerable sum the grand equity to accomplish the required reductions deprived several members of the household of their carriages and mine was included in the reform some days after this measure was carried out his majesty charged me with some commission for which a carriage was required i told him that i no longer had mine I was unable to obey his orders. The emperor then exclaimed that it was not his intention and that Monsieur de Calincourt understood retrenchments badly and that when he saw the Duke de Vicence again, he told him he did not wish to have anything touched that concerned me. In the mornings, the emperor sometimes read the current new books and novels. When a work displeased him, he threw it into the fire. It would be an error to believe it was only bad books that were burned in this fashion when the author was not one of those whom he liked or if he spoke to well of foreign people that was a sufficient reason for committing the volume to the flames i saw his majesty throw a volume of the baroness de stael's book on germany into the fire if he found us reading in the evenings in the little salon where we awaited the time of his retiring he would look at our books and if they were novels, they were burned without mercy. His Majesty seldom failed to add a little lecture to the confiscation and to ask the delinquent if a man could not be reading something better than that. One morning when he had run through and thrown into the fire a work by I know not what author, Rustam stopped to pull it out. But the emperor posed it saying, let the trash burn. It is all it is fit for. The emperor did not ride gracefully, and I think his seat would not always have been firm if such pains had not been taken, never to give him any but perfectly trained horses. There were no precautions on this point that were not taken. The horses intended for the personal use of the emperor passed through a rude novitiate before arriving at the honor of carrying him. They were accustomed to suffer every sort of torture without making the least movement. They were struck over the head and ears with a whip, Drums were beaten, pistols fired, and firecrackers set off close beside them. Flags were shaken before their eyes. Heavy packets, sometimes even sheep and pigs, were thrown between their legs. <laughs> it was essential that even in the midst of the most rapid gallop, the emperor liked no other pace. He should not be able to bring his horse to a dead stop. Nothing in a word would serve him but thoroughly broken horses. Monsieur Jardin Sr., his Majesty's equerry acquitted himself of this difficult task with great address and skill. Hence, the Emperor prized him highly. His Majesty was very particular about his horses being handsome, and in the later years of his reign, he mounted none but Arabians. There were several of these noble animals that the Emperor had an affection for, among others, La Stierie, which he rode at Mont Saint Bernard and Marengo. After the latter campaign, he desired to have his favorite and his life in the luxury of repose. Marengo and the great Saint Bernard were a sufficiently well filled career. The emperor had also, for many years, an Arabian horse of rare instinct, which pleased him much. During all the time that he awaited his rider, he would have been difficult to discover in him the least grace. But as soon as he heard the drums beating a salute which announced the presence of his majesty, he would draw himself up proudly, shake his head in every direction, paw the ground. And so long as the emperor was on his back, he was the most beautiful horse that could be seen. His majesty esteemed good equerries highly. Therefore, no pains were spared to give his pages the most careful education in this respect. Besides being instructed to ride with solidity and grace, they also practiced vaulting exercises, which one would think would be needed only in the Olympic circus. It was, in fact, one of Monsieur Franconi's equerries who was entrusted with this part in the education of the pages. The emperor had as has been said elsewhere, took no pleasure in hunting except in so far as necess 
necessary to conform to the exigencies of the usage which makes this royal exercise an essential accompaniment of the throne and the crown. Yet I have seen him pursue it occasionally for a time long enough to persuade one that it did not bore him. He hunted one day in the forest of Rambouillet from six in the morning until eight in the evening. It was a stag that caused this extraordinary excursion. I remember that even then they did not succeed in running it down in one of the imperial hunts at Rambouillet, at which the Empress Josephine was present a stag pursued by the huntsman threw itself under the carriage of the empress this refuge did not betray it for her majesty touched by the tears of the poor animal asked the emperor to spare it the stag was spared and the good josephine herself fastened a silver collar about its neck which was to attest its deliverance and protect it from the attacks of all hunters there was one of Her Majesty's ladies who one day showed less humanity than she, and the reply she made to the Empress singularly displeased the latter who loved gentleness and pity in women. They had been hunting for some hours in the woods of Bologna. The Emperor came up to the carriage of the Empress Josephine and began to chat with this lady who bore one of the most ancient and noble names in France and who, without having desired it, people said, had been placed near the Empress. The Prince of Neuchâtel came to say that the deer was at bay. Madame, said the Emperor gallantly to Madame de C, what shall be done with the deer? I leave his fate in your hands. Do what you like with it, sire, she replied. I hardly interest myself in it. The Emperor looked coldly at her and said to the chief huntsman, Since the deer has misfortune not to interest Missy, Madame de C, it does not deserve to live. Kill it. And thereupon his majesty turned rein and departed. He had been shocked by such a response, and he repeated it in the evening on returning from the chase in terms not very flattering to Madame de C. We read in the memorial of St. Helena that the emperor, having been upset and wounded by a boar on a hunting excursion, had a large contusion in one finger in consequence. I never saw, nor did I ever have any knowledge of such an accident happening to his majesty. The emperor did not rest his gun well against his shoulder, and as he would have it heavily loaded and rammed down, he never discharged it without making his arm black and blue. I used to rub the bruise placed with eau de cologne, and his majesty thought no more about it. The ladies followed the chase in open carriages. A table was usually laid for breakfast in the forest, and all who took part in the hunt were invited to it. The emperor once tried falconry, in the plain of Rambouillet. This performance had been commanded in order to try the falconry which the King of Holland, Louis, had sent as a present to His Majesty. All the household made an event of seeing this chase of which they had heard so much, but it seemed to please the Emperor much less than hunting and shooting, and the falconry was never used again. His Majesty was very fond of the theater. He had a marked preference for French tragedy and Italian opera. Cornea was his favorite author. I always found some volume of the works of this great poet on his table. Very often I have heard the emperor repeating as he walked up and down in his room some lines from Cinna or this tirade from The Death of Caesar on the stage of St. Cloud. The evening spectacle often consisted merely of pieces and fragments. They would take one act from one opera and another from another, which is very unsatisfactory for spectators whom the first piece had begun to interest. Frequently, too, they played comedies, and then the household were delighted. The emperor himself enjoyed them very much. How often I have seen him ready to die with laughing at seeing Baptiste the Younger in Les Eritiers. Michaud also amused him greatly. In La Partie de Chaste, Henri IV, I no longer remember in what year it was that during a journey of the courts of Fontainebleau, the tragedy of the Venetians by Monsieur Arnaud Sr. was represented before the emperor that evening at the Couchet. His Majesty talked about the piece with Marshal Durand and supported his criticisms by many reasons. The motives for praise as well as for censure were alleged and discussed. The Grand Marshal spoke little, 
The emperor was never silent, although a very poor judge of such matters. It was a very amusing as well as a very instructive thing for me to listen to the emperor discoursing thus concerning the older new pieces which were played before him. I am certain that his observations and remarks could not but have been profitable to the authors had they been there like me to hear them. For me, if I gained anything, it was to be able to speak here a little, although very little, more pertinently about them than a blind man about colors. However, lest I should speak badly, I will return to things belonging to my department.